switch up the camera. Is that good?
Shift the camera again. Can you shift it more? I already have. Can you guys in Florida hear me? Yes, okay. All right, well, today we're going to cover everything on the screen here, uh, or highlights of it. Um, so the book is a really good guide for 
pyridine synthesis. And as we mentioned before in lecture, maybe it was three, the very best ways of making pyridines are buying them and then substituting them. But every once in a while, you'll need to actually make them. And it often depends on the substitution pattern. And so the general rule of thumb from a strategic perspective is when you see a substitution pattern which is so sort of difficult and backwards that substitution is taking too many steps, then you should start thinking about the ring synthesis approach. And uh, the other good rule of thumb is when you start taking a pyridine and infusing it onto other things, the rules for engagement for making the ring become more important. So although the mono and di and tri-substituted uh, monomeric pyridine may be best made through ring substitution approach, when you start fusing things onto it, the things you're going to learn today, although some, some cases somewhat obscure, will provide pivotal bond disconnections for you in the real world. So we will cover a mixture of um, natural product synthesis and medicinally important compounds, leaning heavily, obviously, on the medicinally important compounds. There'll be uh, a lot of radiochemical fun here today. And uh, in general, we can summarize uh, several hundred pages of the book on pyridine synthesis with basically this one little scheme on the top. In general, if you're going to make a pyridine ring, just like when we talked about pyrroles, furans, thiophenes, when we saw that, we thought, okay, that's going to be a 1,4 dicarbonyl. And when we see a pyridine, the first thing you're going to think about is, let's get to the 1,5 dicarbonyl. And the key is, you don't need to necessarily worry about the exact oxidation state. So when we look at this pyridine precursor, a 1,5 dicarbonyl, in pink, I've got a optional unsaturation. So the optional unsaturation can be incorporated by the way you make the ring, or it can be incorporated tangentially through the use of a reagent. So if I had a 1,5 dicarbonyl with no olefin there, and I wanted to make a pyridine from it, what type of reagent do you think I could use to get directly to the pyridine? Now luckily, we are armed with two people on the pyridine team who have already studied this, and they know everything in this chapter, and are going to finish the lecture for me today. So Steve and Dong Min, I'm going to call them a lot, right? You're the pyridine people. Uh, so what, what uh, re, uh, you know, if I had ammonia, is that going to give me a pyridine with no olef in there? What is it going to give me? A dihydropyridine. So what would be my options, with, given the dihydropyridine, what would be my options for oxidizing it up? You might get away with air. Air might be fine. Depends on the dihydropyridine. Air might be just fine. some chemical oxidant. Pick your favorite one. MnO2, DDQ, chloroanyl, TBHP with a metal, iron tri trichloride. I mean, there's, there's, there's probably a smaller list of oxidants that cannot do that reaction than can. Now, what if I want to incorporate it using the reagent and not through an external oxidant? Hydroxylamine. Hydroxylamine is a great idea. So Hannah remembers when we talked about the biotin synthesis, perhaps. Remember the biotin synthesis, we had a keto dihydrothiophene. And we took the keto dihydrothiophene, we added the hydroxylamine to it. That oxime then turned into a thiophene by virtue of isomerization. Same thing here, you can add hydroxylamine, you make the dihydropyridine N hydroxy derivative, which loses water to give you a pyridine. All right, great. Now, the three ways you're going to make pyridines are going to be in order of popularity. Most popular, condensation, obviously, and that encompasses a lot of what I showed on the, on the book there, and you look in the starburst. The next is going to be cycloaddition. We're going to see a lot of cycloaddition today. Think about cycloaddition if you can't get, get it through a condensation. And then finally, the most obscure way of making it is going to be rearrangement. There are a few useful ways of rearranging to make pyridines, but this is the, definitely the least popular of the pyridine synthesis methods, with pyridine ring substitution being an order of magnitude above all these things. Patrick, how often do you make pyridines over there? Haven't made, made a pyridine. That's a real medicinal chemist. Hasn't made a pyridine yet. Do you think it's important to know how to make pyridines? Okay. So then we know. He's making drugs. He's making drugs. He thinks it's important. So we have, to, we have to stay awake today or you can't make any drugs. All right. So how do we make this little simple thing here? I mean, if we just do exactly what I said, just like we did with pyrroles and furans and didn't think at all and just said, well, he just told us to make a 1,5 dicarbonyl. Maybe we should make a 1,5 dicarbonyl.
Treating that with ammonia is going to give us our dihydropyridine, which Steve taught us we can oxidize up. And treating it with hydroxylamine is going to give us our pyridine. We have a good way of making this that you can just, I mean, basic, uh, basic organic chemistry. You know, 1,5-dicarbonyl is not a 1,4, so there's no umpole logic. We don't need set of reactions. It's natural polarity disconnection. Chang, where do I disconnect? I labeled the carbons for your convenience. Maybe carbon three? Either uh, carbon three to where? Either two three bond or three four bond. Okay. And that will give us uh, three building well, two building blocks. Or we'll call this R one to be consistent. That's it. I am. Aldol and then a Michael addition. Gee, that's not too complicated. So making 1,5-dicarbonyls is already in your comfort zone of basic organic chemistry. It's not heterocycles anymore, which is great because it's not my problem anymore. So if you don't know it, it's your fault, not mine. These are two drugs. They made a lot of companies, including Pfizer, billions of dollars. We should probably know how they made them. So let's give us the... Uh, the 30-second retrosynthesis, Vincent, this one really quick. Uh, disconnect to the, by condensation. By condensation. So, so give, me, give me some building blocks. Uh, you can go from the 1,5 dicarbonyl. And then we can disconnect in exactly the same way we just did, correct? So our building block will simply be mixing this with this aldehyde and then get a bucket to collect the money. <clears throat> this is, by the way, known as the Hanch pyridine synthesis. Norvask is a little bit more complicated because we've got differential groups here. So these two first examples were sort of the dump and stir case where you take because it's symmetrical. But if it's not symmetrical, it just means we're going to have to do things in a little bit of a stepwise fashion. So we would first, in this case, just disconnect by looking at this piece separately from that piece. So we would independently take that, cheap. We've, of course, got our aldehyde. And then we have our pre-made enamide. Mix those first, then dump in that. And that's the interrupted hinge. That's how you get the unsymmetrical ones. <clears throat> OK, so based on everything I've taught you now, we should be able to rapidly make radio-labeled pyridines. Fully substitute it. You know, this is a great example. If you're, if you're confronted with this, Patrick, your substitution skills are not going to help you with this. Can't buy that. Can't buy that. Well, maybe you can now, but person of skill in the art back in 1990 wouldn't be able to buy that. So this is Baycol. I think it's been taken off the market. Uh, it was one of the statin compounds. The full structure is in the front page of your handout somewhere. Okay, so we need to make this radio labeled, and so we need to recall what starting materials we have as a radio chemist and what radio chemicals we can buy for really cheap, and then base our synthesis on that. What do you say, Tucker? Any thoughts here? My instinct is that could be a CO2 at some point. CO2 sounds really good. From what would be my, how do I make this bond? That sounds pretty awesome. That's exactly what they did. Now you just need to give me a nice way to make that.
Is there a good way to take a carboxy and turn it into a bromide? You know, we can do a good old Barton decarboxylation. That works. So what we get to is actually one of the process intermediates. Recall that as a radiochemist, your job is going to be to scour the catalog, the internal inventory of what they've got. You'll find out they got a lot of this compound. You know what they also have as an intermediate? Not surprisingly, after the uh, selective reduction of the diester, they've got that too. So we'll take their kilos of this compound. We don't care what the yield is. We'll make the Barton ester. We'll heat it up in bromoform. That'll give us our, our bromide. And I don't know, it's about 40 or 50% yield. But we don't care. The yield could be 2%. It's more than enough because you have unlimited quantities of this. And our only goal in life is to save money on that and get 10 mg of this for the PK people. <clears throat> we happy with problem today, number one? Questions? What do you say, Pavel? No, all these dihydrodivity drugs, are they pro drugs or do they... Are they what drugs? Are they pro drugs or are they active? Oh, that's a great question. I, I've asked that question before. It really depends. Some of them are oxidized in C2 to the uh, pyridine. And some of them have remarkable stability as a function of the AR group. Yeah, I, I'm not sure in the case of, of these two ones what the half-life is or what the rate of oxidation is. And, I, and further, I'm not even sure whether the active component is the fully aromatic. Maybe the TAs can look that up, and we'll get back to you in a few minutes. So Pavel's asking, is the active drug actually the pyridine or the dihydropyridine? I think it's the dihydropyridine, but I could be mistaken. They'll find out. It's a great question. Other questions? Okay, cool. How about this one? This is from AstraZeneca. We need some good bond disconnections here. And this one, we will actually want to perform this one to make 100% control of that stereo center. Well, it looks like I already drew the answer for you, right? That's how easy these are. There's no strategy involved. It's just, okay, there's a 1,5-dicarbonyl. Obviously, if I'm seeing dihydropyridine, ring substitution would be completely illogical. So I'm just going to draw the 1,5-dicarbonyl. Okay, the only, left, the only question that's sort of left unanswered here is, how do I control the chirality? <clears throat> Conjugate addition of what there, Tenor? Narrow bromic acid. Oh, that's interesting. So uh, Tanner's uh, disconnection is, is relatively modern. Let's talk about it. So um, to get this to go, we probably have to do, um, would you agree we've got to protect this somehow? Yeah. You want this, and you want AR, veronic acid, some rhodium, some Hayashi chemistry. I don't think we can mark that wrong on a test. It's, it's a fine proposal. Yeah. Now, what if I wanted to scale this thing up the kilo scale and not have the rhodium or the ligand? Is there a simple way to do this? Condense on an auxiliary? Yeah. So you could just take um, this, this intermediate here, arises just from. Uh, this mean super duper cheap, condense on with your Michael acceptor, and then flush this after the condensation, flush it with ammonia. It goes via this intermediate, and then cyclizes closed. 
you do the first one at relatively lower temperature, then you dump in ammonia, and ammonia exchanges out. You can even recover that auxiliary. If you look on the front page of your handout, you'll see this compound called promotheosin. There it is. Uh, and um, for your convenience, I did not draw it out. It's a pretty big molecule. The key disconnection we're going to make is going all the way back to this building block. And by looking at this building block, you should be able to derive a named reaction based upon what we've already learned here already. <clears throat> So the disconnection that you think might be, what are your first thoughts based on the first uh, 10 minutes of class here, Zhang? Okay, okay, okay. You can't go wrong with the 1,5-dicarbonyl. That's it. We don't need complicated strategy. We don't need artificial intelligence. We just need a 1,5-dicarbonyl. And uh, to make things easier, I'm just going to put what the intermediate would probably look like. There's your 1,5-dicarbonyl. One of them is in the side of enamide. And now, making this compound is your problem. This is not a heterocycle. <clears throat> Max, any thoughts? Okay, so Max has derived for us the lovely reaction known as the Bowman rats. Take this one, make the enamide, just react with ammonia, room temperature. Then take that enam enamine that you made and add it into there, and uh, you'll get out your pyridine. Bowman rats. Patrick, is that easier than a Suzuki? And he's like, ah, questionable, questionable. All right, well, I think if you needed this substitution pattern for a pyridine, Patrick, I could make 100 analogs faster than you if I use this strategy versus if I started thinking about Suzuki land. I think. It would depend on how rapidly you can get, I mean, if you want to interrogate this part too, where, where the diversity is, where, what you want to hold constant and what you want to vary, I guess. But this is super easy condensation chemistry. When we're proposing these, does it matter if the alkyne component is very expensive? For MedCam, no, and that's not very expensive. You can make that from acetylene and the corresponding wine reb of the, of the acetate. So that... That's not so bad. That's not expensive. Expensive by what? I mean, if you look in Aldrich, everything is expensive. Those guys are, you know, this is being recorded, so I need to be careful. <laughs> we collaborate with them. They're great. <laughs> Buy everything from them. But if they don't have it in stock, uh, Combi Blocks is also a pretty good place. And... <laughs> yes, need to be careful. In practice, do you get double addition into the... Nope. Cyclization happens super duper quick, so you never get the double addition. At least I've never seen it. And hypothetically, if you did get it, and let's say it was formed in trace quantities, the retro is also possible. But never seen it. Usually after it adds, it's no longer very electrophilic at that position. It's fully conjugated, so it's ready to cyclize. And remember, heterocycles love to be aromatic, and they love to form. So there's a great driving force to form these things. Okay. Now, here's another, uh, this is a fun one, elliptocene, um, because we're going to cover sort of one route, which is quite 
retrosynthetically accessible. And it, as usual, the Woodward route, which is completely inaccessible through retrosynthesis. Right, have you noticed that? You took classics with Ryan. You can't use retrosynthetic analysis on Woodward synthesis. You can retrospectively apply retrosynthetic analysis, but it looks bizarre. Did you look at the classics book and go to the Woodward chapters? where they try to do retrosynthetic analysis for them, it makes no sense. So we'll cover one that makes sense, and we'll cover one that's completely nonsense, but super pretty. I mean, that's not a slight on Woodward. I mean, obviously, what, they, what he did was brilliant and genius and will never be re reproduced ever, but um, it doesn't have as much educational value because it's hard to, you look at it and you're like, well, I don't understand how you even came up with that. Okay, so let's go through the logical one first. This one's from Kozakowski. And uh, we need some good disconnections. We've got our few, first uh, indole connected through an aromatic ring distantly to a pyridine. And so we've got two different types of heterocycles. So we've got the indole team, folks like Saul, who will be in a cage match with people like Steve. So, um, Saul, why don't you give us some thoughts on anything about this compound? It can be the indole, but probably not the pyridine, because that's Steve and Dong Min's territory. So, the, of the rings drawn, B is the least aromatic, so from a strictly, like, first principle of logic perspective, that's the one that doesn't disconnect. But I think disconnecting on ring C makes more sense. Okay. That, that logic he used is very interesting. So if you use the which one is more aromatic logic, um, that works when you're talking about fused, arom fused header aromats. But when you're talking about one like this where it's skipped, you can almost look at it as the amalgamation of two separate countries. So you don't necessarily need to think about breaking up this one to its core or breaking up this one to its core necessarily. Not yet. For the first disconnection, breaking ring C makes a lot of sense. And if we were to break up ring C, we would recall that a pi-rich uh, pi, uh, heterocycle likes to do things like Friedel crafts. And so we would then conclude that, hmm, maybe we could break that bond there. And if we were to treat this thing with acid, it should snap shut to give the product. Would you agree? And making this compound might derive just from the corresponding nitrile. And then we need Steve's help because we have to figure out how to put this pyridine in. That is a fantastic exercise to do. So I'm going to abbreviate that as indole. And I'll just arbitrarily put the olaf in there. Does that look super accessible for you? So assuming substitution is off the table, and some of you may be screaming, hey, Phil, why not just do some sort of bond disconnection there, or some sort of cross-coupling or whatever? But that's not on the table at the moment. If, so if we do condensation and we come up with a conclusion that that looks kind of not really, don't know where to take that thing, the next thing we want to think about is cycloaddition. 
And so embedded in this creature is a signaling element for a cycloaddition. There's your oxazole again. Remember we saw our friend oxazole when we talked about what was it that we talked about? Does anybody remember? So, so I can't hear Max. It was a pyrrole. Ah, yeah. So pyrroles can be forged this way too, but so can pyridines. If you can't do the retrocyclo addition, and instead you just treat this with acid, that's the right oxidation state for a pyridine, isn't it? And now all we have to do is draw the corresponding oxazole. And um, it will be immediately apparent to probably the indol team why they did this. Before we talk about that, you said there was a signaling element. Are you just talking about like substitution at one three position, not in the two position? And the signaling, the signaling element is you make the one five dicarbonyl, and it looks to you sort of intuitively as I don't know where to go. <laughs> because I've got two aldehydes, and it's like, geez, you know, that to me, that looks harder than that. However, this looks easier than this, and that <laughs> looks easier than that. So it's always the same rule with, with retrosynthetic analysis. Your products after the disconnection should look easier. If they do not, you're either in, the, in uh, possession of an overbred intermediate, which on rare occasions can be useful, or you are in possession of a non-operative retrosynthetic analysis. What do you think? No, no good? You don't agree? You guys are laughing. We're just laughing at the term overbred intermediate. Oh, overbred, yeah. Overbred, yeah. You don't like overbred. Okay, well, take it up with the classics teachers. That's not my game anymore. Okay, so um, one can make this oxazole from the corresponding uh, tryptophan or tryptamine pretty easily. And um, so now all we have to do is think about what Woodward was coming up with. So Woodward took this intermediate, and uh, this is definitely an intermediate he had in mind. However, I'm going to distort it a little bit in, in ways which might be a little mind-bending. Yes, there's two indoles on there. And when you take this compound and you simply heat it up, it turns into the product. Now, how do you make this? Let's talk about that for a minute. That one starts from a simple pyridine. So we take a simple pyridine. We take this compound and we couple it with indole and zinc chloride. We then treat this with zinc and acetic and hydride, and that gives that. It, it, did, can you use retrosynthetic analysis to get this stuff there, Lucas? Is that intuitive to you? It's not intuitive to me. That's super bizarre. But that's what Woodward did. How does the other indole fall off? Well, under acidic conditions, you can obviously protonate it, and then you can draw arrows for them to kick in and leave, and the indole leaves. 
And if that's confusing to you, draw it out. And if you're still confused, come see me. How about vitamin B6? When you take vitamin B6 and you think about the 1,5-dicarbonyl disconnection, does it make complete intuitive sense to you? What do you think, Nick? Vitamin B6, do you want to do 1,5-dicarbonyl? Um, well, it's possibly easier to start with everything. Uh, Perhaps it would be easier to start with what? So already start with the, uh, like, to make our therapy. And then do what? Ring substitution? Wrong class. We got to make the pyridines today. And ring substitution is going to be, uh, you know, you might be able to get there, but it's just going to be a lot of lithiations. It's going to be long winded. What if we use the same type of logic we just used? And imagine that this comes from. hydride plus that cycloaddition takes place at zero degrees and then you treat it with a little bit of acid it aromatizes if your acid is in ethanol you get the diethyl ester and then you can reduce that down with whatever your favorite reducing agent is and get out pure doxel or vitamin B6. It's not pure doxel, it's vitamin B6. Pure is just the same thing with an aldehyde, right? Yeah, okay. but I didn't want you to come after class and say, hey, Phil, you said pure doxel, but that's I the aldehyde. I really didn't know what the structure of pure doxel. Yeah, just the aldehyde, yeah. Being very careful with the nomenclature, folks. Okay, where's uh, Xi Jin? Okay, buddy, there's your uh, daily Boger test. We can't go through a class of heterocyclic chemistry without touching on uh, Dale's beautiful work. So the Boger pyridine synthesis, I don't know, this is back from the 80s. I think he invented this back in the 80s, a long time ago. He didn't look much different, actually. Right? Like, he has great genes. He never ages. Anyway, how does this work? Great news that you get to stay in the group. <laughs> Super. That's why you only need catalytic pyrrolidine. That's the Boger Puritans. It has been used many times by many people. I've even actually seen it used in industry. If you've got that substitution pattern, it's really hard to beat. The only caveat of this is it's not going to be for process chemistry. And that's because uh, the triazines and, as we'll see in a moment, the tetrazines are often energetic. And so they're not that safe on huge scale. But for med medicinal chemistry purposes, this is a really good way to go. Let's take a look at the structure of streptonigrin on the front page of your handout. And we'll just connect and go back to this intermediate. And now, thinking about Boger pyridine synthesis logic, 
what might be the uh, disconnection you would think about? What do you say, Max? You look like you want to tell me. Oh, you just said tetrazine, so go back to a tetrazine. Well, I need to, I make, I need to make a stop off first or something oh, else. Um, so I guess disconnect the um, methyl and aryl on the bottom half of the ring. And then disconnect uh, the quinoline. I'm just going to put Q for quinoline. And in place of this unit, I'm going to put nitrogen as a placeholder. And my donor can be anything here. It can be that. It can be an enol ether. All of those work. You can use the enamine, enol ether, whatever. Th anything that's electron rich is fine. And it's regio controlled. And then, if we want to go back to the tetrazine, as Max said, we're going to excise now this portion here. So the quinoline comes from the nitrile. You add in thio, uh, 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 methyl thiol. And then when you do your cycle addition, you, you make a smelly reaction, but you get also a, a triazine product. And then after that, dump in your enamine, and then lose nitrogen again. And then a few manipulations, you get out the natural product. It's pretty nifty. Before we move on to the cytosine saga, one of the most glorious examples in the history of natural products. Let's cover problem data number two. It's a type of reaction we haven't covered yet. It's the least popular of them, and I need a volunteer. So uh, where's the iPad, and where's the volunteer? Luckily, Max2 has looked up at the appropriate time. So let's see, problem data number two, what is it? Okay. All right, what are you up to there, Max? All right, that looks interesting. You drew a tautomeric form of the... Yeah, alternatively, I could condense onto that. Well, what, I mean, the, why don't you draw the product that you get from that ammonia addition? It's, it's interesting you draw it like that. Okay, Max. Now look at that second intermediate. Can you get to that sec second intermediate without going to the first intermediate you drew? The first intermediate is the starting material. No, the first intermediate you drew is this crazy oxonium. Yeah, it's just a resonance. Well, um, you, you normally don't want to, I mean, it. That, it, that's a, a yeah. I guess you're you're right, but um, if you want to think of it that way, you can. But I think the better way to think about it would just be say, this is a, yeah, this is a delta plus position. Yeah. 
And if I add ammonia into this, I get your same intermediate. So you should still be happy. Yeah. I would have had to draw one less structure. You would have had to draw one less structure, but it just would have looked less weird to imply that there's a, you know, that that resonance form is an actual intermediate. Rather, it is a resonance form that contributes to allowing this to become delta plus. And then finishing it, yes, exactly. What happened? What happened, Saul? <laughs> this iPad is trash. I'm just quoting. The what? <laughs> just <laughs> Oh, yeah, well, it's not my iPad. It's the, <laughs> it's the grad office's iPad. You know, because you guys pay so much tuition. <laughs> oh, wait. Yeah. Well, it's because you pay us so well. That's right, yeah. We do pay you well. You know, when I was a graduate student, you know what they would leave in our mailbox? Some oranges and a bag of rice for the month. <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, the reason we didn't have... The reason we didn't have rattlesnakes is because that was our protein. And now you have rattlesnakes in the parking lot, it's because we pay you too much, right? <laughs> Things were much different in my day. It snowed in San Diego. <laughs> and it was hilly. Yeah, you guys have it easy. Anyway, great. Thank you, Max. Okay, let's talk about cytosine. Cytosine is an interesting natural product because everybody always says natural products are useless in drug discovery. But here's one that came, this is a, one that originates at Patrick's company. This is a Pfizer <laughs> compound. Does anybody know the name of the drug that emerged from this? It's called Chantix. It's a billion dollar drug for smoking cessation. Uh, people, I've talked to people who use it and they say, I just don't feel like smoking anymore. It works great. And some people say it gives you wild dreams. Um, and it does have a black, black box label because in some cases it made people feel a little bit suicidal. But that's rare. <coughs> so, um, but anyway, Chantix, which we will talk about a lot when we talk about pyridazines, actually arose from the deep study of a natural product of the lupin alkaloid family. And this story begins with the Van Tamelin synthesis back in 1958. So we'll start with that. And then we'll move on to the re-examination of the cytosine synthesis back in 2000 by Pfizer people. Two different medicinal chemistry groups came up with two different ways of making the natural product. That's not the structure of Chantix, but when you see the structure of Chantix one day, you'll say, wow, that's pretty similar. It has a lot of similarities to it. Okay, so let's start off with Dan Van Tamlin. Van Tamlin made a key disconnection that everyone made except uh, one of the Pfizer groups. And um, as, as stewards of retrosynthetic analysis, we all know we want to break bonds that remove bridging elements. And the bond that seems to be the most logical to break here that would reduce complexity and perhaps be the easiest to form would be perhaps what? Carbon-nitrogen bonds are great to break. So let's break the carbon-nitrogen bond. And I believe that's problem with number three if we can get the, uh, the screen up there. A well, problem of the day number three asks the question, how do you make that from earth, air, water, and fire? Or very close to it. So Hannah has uh, gracefully uh, volunteered for problem of the day number three. And, and you can call it out if you want, or you can um, draw it on the wonderful iPad that everybody loves. So there it is. Okay. 
benzylamine plus formaldehyde plus that interesting starting material, which I'll show you how they make in a moment, gives us our product. And let's just put the acid here to be the same as the problem. And our starting material, let's draw that out. So the first thing Hannah is doing is making a formaldehyde adduct with benzylamine. That sounds great. Super. Now what do we do with that thing? That's what I'm trying to figure out. So, uh, Hannah, while, while you guide us through your thoughts here, because I think everyone would find this very instructive, we've got a pyridine that has on it some interesting and peculiar functional groups. That, tell us about that olefin. Is the olefin on that pyridine a normal styrene? No. Why not? It's like basically conjugated to an imine. So it's kind of like a, I would look at it like almost like methyl vinyl ketone, right? Sure. Okay. Now, the other thing on there is that malinate. And that malinate is pretty, what, acidic, or is it? Uh, it's got a lot of acidic conditions. It's not really a malinate. It's like a pretty acidic base. Okay, yes. And the third one? Oh, I can't draw it. Oh, that's good. Yeah, so any of those could be perhaps nucleophiles, but sure. only one of them leads you down a road which is thermodynamically an endpoint. I suppose that's. You, let's, why don't we go down that route? You made a great electrophile. You've got a great nucleophile. Okay, super. So when you have diacid versions of malonates like this, I usually think of that position as not that acidic at all. Equilibrium. Diana, Equilibrium. Very, very yep. Now, the adduct you have is uh, sort of dangerously close to the final product, isn't it? Yes, it is. All we need to do is what? That sounds great, and you're done. So you get a cyclization, and you get out loss of CO2, and you get out your product. That's 1958 Van Tamelen. Um, so that it is, uh, they, so that you get the, as I recall, the bisequatorial product. Well, you can, you the can you get what? You the position. Under those conditions, you can also primerize the so thermodynamic. Now, this is high heat. They fish this stuff out in reasonable yield. I think it's around 50%. But it's a great degenerate process where you can draw multiple mechanisms, and you could have drawn, if you wanted to, your carboxylates attacking the manic salt. Wouldn't have mattered. Would have just reversed. Steric chemistry can be messed up. It'll equilibrate. Don't forget this is connection, folks. We will see it again. Oh, by the way, they make this compound uh, just from, if you're wondering how they made the starting material for problem day number three. Plus time. Plus uh, malinate anion. Okay, so when it came time to interrogate nicotinic receptors, because you want to inhibit people's desire to pick up a cigarette, uh, the Pfizer folks re-examined this natural product. And they needed a route to make this and various analogs of it. And so two different medicinal chemistry teams at Pfizer, this was at Groton, one led by the O'Neill group and one led by the Co group. Uh, Jotham Co, by the way, would eventually go on to be the inventor of Chantix. Came up with 
two completely different ways of making this compound. One of them looks like a, what you would do in a total synthesis group, and one of them looks like what you would do based upon only knowing things like Stille, Suzuki, Nagishi. So the first one starts off from the O'Neill group. We'll talk about MedChem root number one, where they looked at this retrosynthetically and they said, hmm, if you take a bipyridine and you draw it suggestively with angles that are not quite right, but if you draw it suggestively, this looks very similar if we reduce some things here and there to the product. Of course, geometrically, you can't get that to ever cyclize. But if we draw it suggestively like this, it implies, you know, all we need to do is do some manipulations to get it there. That's the logic. Now, how do we put this thing together? Well, it starts off with a reaction. Where, where's the uh, Engel group people? Tanner, what, what's that reaction? Which one? The two bromides, palladium and ditin. Yeah, so it's a stilly kelly coupling is when you take two bromides. And how come you don't just get, like, dimerization of the two individual, you know, homodimers instead of the desired heterodimer? Any thoughts? Um, so one is electron rich, and the other one is... It's all about oxidative addition. Didn't you learn? You have that organometallic class, right? It's after this one? Okay, yeah. So the oxidation, uh, oxidative addition rate of that 2-bromopyridine is going to be better than the 3-bromopyridine. So that one first converts to the 2-tin species. And then you proceed with a canonical Stille reaction. What, what's your thoughts at uh, Pfizer on the Stille reaction there, Patrick? People usually don't want to use it. But they do sometimes. When do they use it? Tell, teach us about that. When the other cross-couplings don't work. And usually, um, stilly coupling works really well when you've got a lot of Lewis basic nitrogens or when you've got a, a Suzuki coupling where the boronic acid would never be stable. Then the stilly coupling is really useful. You know, they're worried about toxicity of the tin, and it's true, it can ruin your bioassays, but if you purify it properly, it's fine. People to this day still use stilly, but you don't want to go to, it's not your go-to reaction. Anyway, they did the stilly kelly coupling, and they got out the product, okay? And then the next question is, we we're going to treat this with benzyl bromide and then sodium diphionate, and that's going to do two things. The first one we need to talk about is the benzyl bromide. Uh, benzyl bromide has some options for alkylation on this bipyridine. Hey, Cheng, um, what's benzyl bromide going to do to that system in general? Benzylate either the nitrogen. Okay. Um, I guess the alum will be first benzylate. I mean that. I mean the only way we can really figure it out is by popular vote. Everybody in favor of A. A lot of people. And then B? Jess, is your hand up, or is it kind of in a resting state? It's up? Yeah. You guys are outnumbered. Uh, all right, so we need a representative, uh, a delegate, so to speak, from uh, the A crowd. And uh, Chang, it looks like everyone's voted you as the representative for the A crowd. So please explain yourself. Yeah, it makes sense to me. Uh, uh, how about Jess? You appear to be the delegate for between you and Steve. He, he's nudged you as the representative. So uh, why don't you give us the minority opinion? Sterix. Sterix? <laughs> have you ever seen a debate where they win the debate with one word? <laughs> you just have. So Jess is right. Uh, pyridine alkylations are governed almost exclusively by sterics, having very little to do with electronics. So 
The correct answer is we put a benzyl group here. Smashing all expectations, the B team wins. All right, now we've got a charged pyridinium, and we've got this uh, reducing agent, uh, dithionate. And presumably the way this uh, dithionate works is controversial in literature. It's not really clear, but the mechanism which has been posited for this is going through the intermediate intermediacy of this type of species. When you dissolve sodium dithionate in water, it gets reduced to HSO3 anion, and that's a powerful reducing agent. And presumably after loss of water, they, they posit you get something like this, which then can decompose, and that anion is then quenched with water. The alternative hypothesis is that you get a sulfonate to form. That is, sulfur goes here, and then you get either decomposition through a radical or the same loss of SO2. Uh, I'm showing you this one because it has literature support. But the other one is fine by me in terms of thinking about it. Okay, so after we do that, the stage is now set to finish. Okay, so H2 and platinum followed by LAH. That's going to take down the two olefins. Not going to touch this pyridine. LAH is going to take down our um, ester. And now we have something looking very similar to Van Tamelen's intermediate. So mesyl chloride, mesylates here. Heating it up ha initiates an alkylation event on the mesylate. And to finish it off, H2 palladium knocks off the benzyl. During the heating step, guess what happened? This alkylated, you ended up with this O-methoxy which the chloride came back, added in to here to give, uh, or any nucleophile added back, uh, the mesylate even, to give you uh, methyl mesylate and the pyridone. You see that? Now in the Van Tamlin synthesis, he does not have the oxidation state he needs, so he needs to use an, a strong oxidant going through uh, sodium hydroxide and potassium ferrocyanide, a very old method for generating pyridones, from pyridines. In the case of Pfizer, they took advantage of simply a methoxy as a protecting group for a pyridone. It's a latent pyridone. Okay, great. Questions on the first synthesis of this? The second one is quite a bit different. This one is from Jotham Co. And uh, he looked at this and, and said, you know, this pipyridine is essentially just a cyclopentene hiding. If you take a cyclopentene and you oxidatively lyse it down the middle, you have a dialdehyde, which upon treatment with ammonia and the reducing agent will give you and recapitulate your pipyridine. And now we have to disconnect that. Do you see any hidden symmetry in that molecule? Solstice is a hidden symmetry, so why don't you reveal it to us? Just a 4 plus 2, he says. Between what and what? In what? Uh, something like this? Yeah, yeah that, that unfortunately won't get you there. That's a weird one. Because you've got a, a four pi and a four pi. That's not quite not quite not quite a cycloaddition. I'm looking for a different symmetry. 
this is this is not quite it. It's definitely uh, tempting to use cyclopentadiene. What other bond can I break? If I do what Steve said before and I break an NC bond, is that product more simplified? So let's do what, what Steve said to do before in a different context completely. Is that simpler to make? Does anybody want to make that compound? Nick, you like that compound? Which one? This? Oh, the, the third one? Um, yeah, it's better. Yeah. You think it's better? Well, we don't have many options left. Luckily, no one said metathesis. You can draw that one out, but that's not going to be, anyway, it's not going to be good because the ring open form is favored than the ring closed. So that divinyl is not going to be good. There's not many bonds left to break, folks. We've only got one left. This one you, Sorry? You could just use a, a palladium into like a Mizoraki. Uh, Mizoraki heck on, on that, that's a great idea. Uh, that's great, Nick. <coughs> you mean this? Yeah. How do I control the region chemistry? Um. If I can't control the region chemistry through intermolecular means, what are my other options? Aha. Yeah. And that's exactly what Jotham Co. did. So he took this starting material, perfectly symmetrical, then reacted it with glutaramide, made the enol phosphate, Enol phosphates, by the way, much better than enol triflates when you're making them from lactams. These are very stable. You can run a column on them. He then did the mesorarchy heck. It's symmetrical. It doesn't matter where it goes. That gives you this compound missing the olefin, which can then be oxidized up. How do you like that? Super short. Do you prefer this synthesis or the other one? What, what's that? Kind of depends. Kind of depends. Agreed. If I need large quantities of cytosine really quick, I probably would prefer this one. But if I want to make some crazy analogs that may not be accessible, otherwise, depending on the analog, that one may be a better <coughs> way to go. Bless you. Questions? And these basic studies eventually led to a billion dollar drug. This is only part one of the story. We will see more Chantix fun after the midterm. Okay, so problem of the day number four in our final 20 minutes or so is to talk about some case studies and how to make these and please make them through ring synthesis rather than ring substitution. And uh, perhaps it makes sense to illuminate the board. They may, people over there may not be able to see the board. I don't know. So this first one, one needs to view it through the lens of a person skilled in the art from many years ago. Because you may say today, this is a really bad problem of the day. I can just make it through a Nagishi coupling of a halo acid and be done with it. That's the way you would make it today, right, Patrick? OK. So rather than torture you with the uh, ruminations on what somebody did 20, 30 years ago, let me just tell you that the way they started was through the thought that they wanted to use a cycloaddition strategy. And the further realization that this can be selectively oxidized with selenium dioxide. Many things will oxidize C2 positions of pyridines. 
all the way to the corresponding acid. And then you can use 1,5-dicarbonyl logic. But here's how it works. The 1,5-dicarbonyl logic gets us to a dihydropyram. And this dihydropyran is made from that. And this is an inverse electron Diels Alder reaction. This is the Chiofellini pyridine synthesis, and it is quite valuable in certain cases where the substitution patterns don't really allow you very quickly to get access through Suzuki's or Silly's or ring substitution. And it can be used to make a variety of things. For instance, this one or this one. Where does this one come from? Same logic. You can take this straight out of an undergraduate laboratory. If you take cyclohexanone and mix it with benzaldehyde exhaustively, you'll get that bis-aldol adduct, right? Mix it with ethyl vinyl ether, followed by hydroxylamine, and you'll get out the product. Same story with this one, guys. Simple enone. All right, I gave you the answer to problem number one. But problem number two should really be a collaboration between um, two teams. Really, for this one, we need uh, Dongmin and uh, Max to work together. Either of the Maxes. And there's your clue. So how are we going to make this? Is it going to be RCM? Why not RCM? Why are you laughing? What's wrong with RCM? Uh, I think you, you think of what? I think they're too too Maybe. Did you say you don't like RCM? I love RCM. I love Suzuki. But the problem is you will be a um, retrosynthetically handicapped if the only things you know are cross-couplings and modern methods. Back to Definitely on the interview. On the interview, if you, you can't RCM and Suzuki your way out of anything on the interview. Take it to the what? A pro of Chiamen Densen. Am I saying it right? Chiamen. I don't think anyone says it right. Okay. It's the Chiamen Sen Densen re reaction, and Nick will then correct me later. Why don't you just tell me now, Nick, what is it? How do you pronounce Chiamen Sen Densen? Oh, that's right. Yeah. That's right? Yeah, yeah. Ah. Okay. Yeah, Hannah thinks it's wrong. Look, <laughs> folks, it's written on the front page of the handout. It's a Chiamen Sen Densen, and however you want to pronounce it, you'll get full credit. Okay? So. The Chiamen Sen Densted is a rearrangement that requires that as your precursor. Because we know when we take this with chloroform and base, we did the mechanism, and I think Max was the one who solved the mechanism of this when we talked about ring expansions of pyroles to pyridines. And this one is just a NOR synthesis. So enolate, quench with this, treat with acid, nor, done. Great. How about that one? C. I can't hear you. Oh, it like screams Zinke somehow. You want to use Zinke, and that gets us back to... I guess you have to make it. It may be difficult. Yeah. 
but you could propose it. I'm not sure. Maybe with high enough temperature, it would work. <coughs> anyway, keep going. We can do what we always do. Making this? Just stutter. Mm. Oh, no. There's no one four dicarbonyl there. The problem is you're on the pyrrole team, and so everything is a one four dicarbonyl for you. <laughs> well, we can go and, and do the same thing you did before. Mm. Bowman rats. That's easy to make. Hannah, are you okay with that? Okay. Good. Aha. Uh -huh. Aha. Uh -huh. We need to get Ryan in here. <laughs> Tell Ryan not to be afraid of alkynes. I this is because I was trying to do something very similar to this and it was And he like, vetoed it. Uh, yeah. Alright, when in doubt, Ryan's always right. <laughs> uh, that was how I dealt with him. So I think you left out like, <laughs> What's that? I think we left out the most important part of this is like the stereo selective anoculation. Aha! Uh -huh. So, if you do a zinc A reaction, you'll end up with the DMP salt here, and that we know already from lecture number two or three, will exchange whatever's here, in this case ammonia, for whatever's there. Okay, so but, but, we have in our hands, we are in possession of a 1,5 dicarbonyl. And if you can intercept it before adding ammonia, you could just add that amine in. Okay. So, option one is zinc A, less maybe higher priority, because as Max mentioned, it's kind of hindered. Higher priority would just be make your 1,5 dicarbonyl, add in your amine, and that will give you out your pyridinium directly. So you can go directly from here to there. Great. This one, next one, is kind of important and has a very intuitive solution to it. Tucker, when in doubt, what can you say? It's perfect. Look at that. Look at that. So 1,5 dicarbonyl, look at that. And what Tucker has just derived is what's known as the Guareschi thorpe reaction. So if you're stuck on a desert island and only have coconuts, it's likely you could derive this synthesis. That's how simple it is. Cyanoacetamide, the diketone of the <coughs> diphenyl here, mix them together and you get that. Goreshi Thorpe, folks, super, super useful. For example, all of these compounds can be made with Goreshi Thorpe logic. For example, that one. That one. That one. What are the precursors for each of them? Well, all of them are going to use the signaling element for a Guarashi Thorpe is look for the cyanoacetamide, okay? And then piece it back together by finding the 1,3 dicarbonyl. So here's your 1,3 dicarbonyl. That means we need ethyl here, we need a ketone there, and then ester here. That's the ester carbon, that's your ketone carbon. Man, pyridines must be really boring. I'm seeing the yang factor is pretty high. Nobody wants coffee? The water is full? I, I can even serve as your barista today if you'd like some coffee. Yeah, all right, Vince is going to do it. Just got to plug it in, buddy. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, the TAs only did, went so far. <laughs> okay, the next one. The clue here is we're going to use some sort of Boger logic. And I'm going to save you the time here and write out what he did. So this we will see many times as type of intermediate. This is very easy to make. 
And the way Dale put this together was by using kind of like a Chiafalini method. It's an inverse electron Diels Alder. Jin Jin, you remember that? Uh, inverse electron Diels Alder, we're done. How about this last one? This last one, we need somebody who's an ultra deep thinker. Maybe someone who remembers what happens when there's a chlorine and an aldehyde adjacent to one another. Ah, Vilsmeyer. Let's look for the Vilsmeyer. Vilsmeyer hack, whatever. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, where would you say, identify for me, uh, Tucker, uh, where are the atoms of DMF? Well, we need to do it with the ring synthesis. There's one more carbon coming from DMF. And we're going to see this again when we talk about quinolins tomorrow. But you identified one of them. That's great. Take a look at this magic. Treat that with Vilsmeyer reagent, and you get out the product. How do you like them apples? Pretty, pretty good. Patrick, you like that? Super cheap, super easy. Vilsmeyer reagent gives you what? Well, <clears throat> this one goes via... Cyclization, loss of two equivalents of dimethylamine, and there's your product. <clears throat> That's the Vilsmeyer way of making pyridines. And in the final 11 minutes, we have okay. just to cover two more things. One of them is a medchem versus process cage match. And the last one is a radiochemical puzzle. Okay, so when you take a look at this molecule, uh, Sarah, what are your first thoughts as a med chemist? Um, disconnect, the, the disconnect here? That sounds great to me. And then the med chemist says, you know what? I looked on SciFinder, and I can buy buckets of that. I can take my buckets of that. I can do my SNAR. I can then reduce this down. I can lithiate, quench with iodine here, and then I can Suzuki until my face turns red. Right? Everybody see that? The process chemists go into the to picture and they say, well, uh, that's a little bit too expensive. We'd probably like to avoid nitro groups if we can. So maybe we can just get it from this one. And the process chemist says, I can probably do a Hoffman elimination here. That is, turn that into the primary amide, treat it with NBS and sodium methoxide. That will give me the rearranged compound with a carbamate. So the intermediate I'm going to get eventually would be Now the question is, 
how do I incorporate that arene without doing a cross coupling? I don't want the Suzuki. I don't want the lithiation. I don't want the palladium. None of it. The advantage of starting with this ester instead of starting with this nitro is that I can do a conjugate addition directly. So this type of molecule, you can add to it directly an aryl Grignard, and it will add directly there, exclusively, not here. You then treat it with an oxidant like DDQ or MnO2, and you get up to the product. You can't do that with the nitro, because the nitro, of course, will react with the Grignard directly and reduce it. Now the problem with this, of course, is I don't want to do MnO2 on scale. I don't want to do D DDQ. And so although this works for a few kilos, it doesn't work for metric ton. And that gets us back to ring synthesis. So ring synthesis looked at this problem and they said, well, we know we can use a electron withdrawing group and convert this through a Hoffman rearrangement to that. That's known. So what if we were to just make this using that? What in the world is that thing? <clears throat> That's a chrome key salt. And this is great because it's super crystalline, it's super cheap, and it is the conceptual equivalent of Guareshi Thorpe. It takes the place of the cyano, but leaves nothing behind. <clears throat> and uh, I think the only mistake here is we don't need the olefin. That's right. And so if you take this compound and you treat it with POCl3, You get that. You can do a selective SNAR here, and then just reduce this thing off gracefully. And the cyano can be hydrated to the primary amide. When you have primary amide, you can do the Hoffman to get you the uh, carbamate protected aniline. Questions? Oh, we're doing good on time. Because there's only one last problem. Is there a reason not yes. to take this through? Well, you're right. It is the benzaldehyde logic, Saul. It is. They're using benzaldehyde here, eventually. Sure. It is. The, the reason we put this, it's a great question. The reason we put this here is to make this CH bond acidic. If I didn't have this here, I couldn't just take acetamide and add it in, right? Just like a Guareshi Thorpe would not work if it was just that. We need the cyano to make this thing want to do this. Same thing, the chrome key. Chrome key salt is like, think of it like a malinate. Same kind of reactivity. Does that answer the question? I guess. I'm just and it's a placeholder for your oxidation state, too. Yeah, I guess that's, that's the that's where it keeps the oxidation. That, too. Because it just eliminates out, you lose pyridine. It's great. And that's just from the alpha halo Oh, yeah. Just alpha chloroacetamide, dump in pyridine, beautiful crystalline salt. Everything is crystalline. So the process chemists, you can imagine, are doing backflips. Okay, great. Last one. I mean, you may be able to escape a minute early if someone has the answer to this problem. We need a 4-aryl-pyridine, and we need the label. We need two C14 labels. This is a tricky one. At the 2 and the 6 position. Not heard from. Uh, 
Um, any, we just need general thoughts. It doesn't even have to be specific. Uh, Elena, you have any general thoughts for us? Anything, anything at all. Starting materials, thoughts about the compound. Um, why is it easy to use the unlabeled? Oh, that's an interesting idea. So if we start with the ring, ring open compound, or let's just start with the unlabeled compound, we need a method of going from here to something which has given us exposure of these two carbon units. What, what's that? So let's say we made the N oxide, added in a nitrile. Let's say we were able to get that kind of thing there. You see, the, this is a good logic to go through because the ring opening strategy worked well with indoles because it was electron rich. And so I had a good way to excise, open up, and get out. In the case of pyridines, I'm dealing with electron poor. And so my attempts to open a pyridine up are going to be met with the same kind of misery as if I tried to take a benzene ring and open it up. And so although the logic you posited to start from the unlabeled and try to go here is exactly what they probably spent hours brainstorming on how to do, at the end of the day, they just couldn't figure it out. Because there's not a good way to oxidatively open right at that position. So we need to uh, take another step back. Vince, you got an idea? Yeah, actually. All right, let's hear it. It, it, it was a coffee. You see? <laughs> Everyone right. should have the coffee. Can we just go back to the 1,5 that carbonyl and make that from like a dual Grignard and quench with CO? I don't know how well that would work, but. Or CO2. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I can't say that, that it's, that's creative. Uh, you may need to do it stepwise, but I don't think you'd have a problem necessarily making I mean, that it may not be so stable. I'm not sure if you can make the bis Grignard, but maybe the mono and then the bis. Yeah, maybe. I mean, I, you know, if this was a, a midterm, I don't think we could count, I don't think we could take off points. It's, it's a reasonable. It's a good idea. And all you needed was a 1,5 dicarbonyl logic. I mean, you know, if you're at a job interview and you put that on the board, you probably get the job. They'll say, oh, this person's creative. They know it's a 1,5 dicarbonyl. Not bad. It's not bad. If we take inspiration from Van Tamelen, you could just imagine that this comes from uh, the question of the day that Hannah figured out. So if I have this pyridone, I can do a enol triflate and a Suzuki, right? And then aromatize. And if I want to make this labeled, then you can imagine it came from this. And this just comes back from acetone dicarboxylic acid. Plus benzylamine. And my label? Formaldehyde. That's good. You don't like it? I'm just okay. Yeah, what do you say, Pablo? Can we take malonic, some malonic acid derivative for the lady to do a slide back with the label DMF? Just make this and then do standard. Oh, it, it's kind of like a version of this, you mean? Yeah. That would save us the step of having to make the enol triphate. But then you've got to, then you've got to derive your Vilsmeyer reagent in a labeled fashion. 
The advantage of this strategy is that our carbon that we need to eventually appear here comes from formaldehyde. So in the literature, they didn't do either of these things. This is what I would do personally if I had to consult on the problem. They didn't do this. They did something far more creative. They reasoned that this started, the product could be derived from this. So that's pretty cool. You can know if you have that iodide in hand, that Suzuki should work really well. And this... comes from this intermediate. And this derives from that. Plus labeled formaldehyde. Here's the confusing part, the trick of it all. That's not labeled. You okay with that, Hannah? I'm not okay with it. No, I was just about to ask that question. Yeah, it's bizarre. That's crazy stuff right there. Wait, but it does, it is labeled in the product. It certainly is. I would be in deep doo-doo if it wasn't. I mean, it, it's, an, it's an interesting hypothesis. I mean, when, when, you, when you think about the exchange of the unlabeled to the labeled somehow, it almost feels like I'm trying to pitch a flat earth hypothesis to you. Or the moon landing didn't really happen. There's a way to rationalize it. So what happens when I make the intermediate formaldehyde imine here? You took classics with, uh, or synthesis with Ryan. What, what happened? Sorry? I didn't hear you. Oh, yep. 3-3. Three, three. And instead of drawing a forward arrow, I'm instead going to do this kind of arrow. Now look what just happened, folks. This is an equilibrium. And if I have excess of the labeled formaldehyde, this is going to eventually bleed out the unlabeled formaldehyde. And if I let it go to a stationary state for a few hours and then add sodium iodide, I can get both of these to be enriched in the labeled atom. Bias, yeah. Cheng, what do you think of that? This is really good. It's good, huh? Really good. How much excess labeled from aldehyde do you have to use? I do not recall. It's like very expensive. Um, I, I don't think you need more, you know, probably maybe, I don't know, five equivalents or so. would probably be, you know, just statistically, let it go there. Eventually, you're just going to bleed it out to the point where it's going to be mainly enriched in the, in the dye label. And the advantage of this is that you start off with totally unlabeled, one step to this, and then take the crude material and Suzuki oxidize off. That's pretty good. But for a test, there's nothing wrong with what uh, Vince said, and certainly if you wanted to use this old Van Tamelin, Robert Robinson type disconnection, you could do that too. Great. Sorry I went five minutes over, and uh, tomorrow and Thursday, or Wednesday, are the last classes before the midterm. And they're going to be loads of fun. So, see you tomorrow.
memory's sake, you can just remember that. There are examples in literature of where the electron deficiency and the fact that you're adding a lithium are superseding the electrophilicity of the dependent uh, ester. I think that that would also work with the ester. The reason they did it with this is so they can just aesthetically be protected and then do the Hoffman when they get the energy too. But you think it would work? I think it would work just because you're using a lithium and this is super oh, electron deficient. Oh, a grignard, yeah, a grignard. Either one is fine. Grignard is fine. <laughs> but grignards are like super oxygen. Yeah, and you're going to have probably, uh, you know, some Lewis acidity drawing even more electron density away from the aromatic ring. I, there are examples in literature where you've got three ester purines and the, and the even ketones, and the grignard will add it, but only works in cases where the purity is elect pretty electroporic, such as when you've got two electron withdrawing groups, like chloro and an ester. But in the actual case where they scaled up, as I mentioned, they actually used that. So this is not a maneuver you can do, and maybe we should clarify this, it's not a maneuver you can do on a daily basis. You can't just start taking <laughs> yeah. purines with one ester on them and add grignards to them really nilly. Hmm. I guess if this was four, you would go both. If it was two, four, you yeah. might get addition here. I don't know if it was just uh, then I would predict the product would probably be here. I think you'll probably get that. We should confirm it. Yeah, we'll look that up and uh, we will definitely clarify before the end of the week. We should look up the rules for when we can add Grignard's to Puritans because that, that's going to be a point in the future that I should expound upon. So maybe I can start a lecture with a little box on that. Great question. And then yeah. you were saying with selenium dioxide, you yes. can selectively oxidize the C2. C2, yes, not the C3. So why, and then you were like, oh, that's true for all oxidants, like for the most part, right? will go there. No, too. it won't, is the thing. So I am running this reaction right now, taking this compound, and it goes three with KMNO4. And this is literally a precedent. I didn't just make it up, right? But Go C3? Yeah, it's a 5 to 1 ratio, oh, favoring this one. So why do you have any instinct as to why that is, in this case, over other cases? Uh, so the mechanism came up for is totally different than sure, the of selenium dioxide. And so probably it has to do with the fact that the selenium, in the, in the case of selenium, you're taking advantage of the intermediacy of this polymeric form. Which can't happen with that one. Sure. But your instinct was that that would be general. Yeah, I mean, although at the same time, I mean, I guess if I thought about more with the, an oxidant that doesn't go through an ene type mechanism, sure. as selenium does, um, then it would probably go for the benzylic bond that's most aniline, that's most toluene like and less methyl ketone like. Mm -hmm. For example, if you see this, it basically is a question of which one oxidizes first, this one or this one. And in the case of selenium, because of the heat mechanism, you'll get up oxidation here, it won't sure. touch this one. Yeah. In the case of KMNO4, you want the more electron rich CH bond, it's this one and this one. Sure. Okay. I so see. that's the way to rationalize that. So it's not necessarily like a black or white issue, then? Mechan it depends on the mechanism of the reagent. Okay. And so I should probably clarify that too. I'm sorry, yeah. I didn't mean to like. No, 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 yeah. It's one to one here, here. And here. Oh, and, and, oh yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, none of this oxidation product, but, and, and also none of the this, but. So we should address the Grignard addition and uh, the oxidation tomorrow. Yeah, great. That was great, Hannah. <laughs> Thanks very much. No, yeah. That's super. I, uh, the, the purities are the ones that I do, so yeah. I, I'm thinking about this on a like, reasonably regular yeah, basis. Yeah, you know, the, the, the issue with, with the class is if you get into, into too much granular yeah, detail, you then you end up confusing people. But, sure. um, but anyway, if you don't do enough detail, you can confuse some people too. But So these, <laughs> these two points we should bring up tomorrow. Yeah, this is great. Yeah.